and we'll talk about the edible native plants of San Francisco. So we'll talk about what are native plants, what are our native edible plants here in San Francisco, gardening for native plants, and edible garden resources. I realize I'm talking to California Native Plant Society, so um, keep in mind that every plant we eat evolved somewhere. And there's a lot of famous delicious plants from Mexico and Europe and Asia. We've got a lot of fabulous edible plants here in North America, more than just blueberries, cranberries, and pumpkins. So what are our native plants? I realize this is California Native Plant Society. You all likely know what our native plants are, but they're native because they evolved here. And they evolved here in all the complexity that we have here in San Francisco. That upper left shows all the different kinds of soil that we have. Uh, lower left, those are our three different fog and wind belts. And upper right, we have enormous amounts of monthly rainfall variation, both from month to month and within months, depending on how many atmospheric rivers we get. Our, our annual uh, average rainfall is 20 inches, but it can vary from as little as seven inches to as much as 50 inches of annual rain. Last year, we had nine inches of rain. It was incredibly low. And it's one of the reasons that we're seeing so many drought, drought stress, stressed plants and so many plants that have gone summer deciduous early. Our native plants are drought tolerant, tolerant and ecosystem, because, e ecosystem friendly because they evolved here. And they evolved together in plant communities to help each other be resilient to climate change. We've got native grassland communities and our oak woodland plants and riparian, which is a fancy word for creekside. Uh, the riparian plants are not drought tolerant for the most part and they want pretty constant uh, water because they evolved either in or near a creek. We've got coastal dune scrub, which is gorgeous, and our dunes, also really beautiful. All of these plant communities evolved together. And native plants are the base of our food web. Recent research has been published. Doug Tallamy is the, is the guy who has been most, who has done the most work on getting this information out to uh, regular people and not just other researchers on how many different caterpillar species are fed by the leaves of different plants. And for San Francisco, our local willows support the most caterpillar species with oaks and cherries really, really close. The first of the, of the great edible plants that holly leaf cherries has edible fruit, our currants have edible fruit, uh, the huckleberries have edible fruit, and the raspberry family, the ribis family, thimbleberry, salmonberry, and blackberry all have edible fruit, and our, our strawberries do. And all of these, the strawberries on that list are the, the lowest number, and they support 58 different species. So keep in mind that introduced plants only feed between zero and two insects. They're, they're just, they're not native. They might have nectar and pollen for some of our more generalist bees, but they're not gonna feed our caterpillars. And if we don't have caterpillars, we don't have birds. Every plant's an opportunity to feed our ecosystem and ourselves. San Francisco is 68% paved, 68% built on. So the pink flowering current that Noreen just talked about, that, that hummingbird is nectaring on, that's an important plant for that bird. That plant grows from, blooms from December to February. So it's an incredibly important plant for the hummingbird and then we get to enjoy the berries. So let's talk about our native edible plants. So here's our guide. These are the different kinds of um, symbols that you'll see for each one of the plants because some of the plants have edible leaves, some have edible seeds and nuts, some of them have edible bulbs or roots. Some have edible flowers, which are gorgeous and delicious, and some have edible fruit. Let's look at our spices. California spice poppies have got edible seeds, and they've got a delicious toasty flavor. Anywhere that you would use poppies in a recipe, poppy seeds in a recipe, you can use our California poppy seeds, and they're very easy to grow. The chia sage, like all of the salvia family is entirely edible. So the seeds are edible, the flowers are edible, and the leaves are edible. And those seeds have that interesting um, property and texture. So you can use them anywhere that you would use a, a, a chia seed 
seed in a drink or in a dressing. Western wild ginger has got a fabulous, spicy, sweet flavor to it. It's edible raw or cooked, so you can use it in delicious Indian dishes. You can use it as a tea. You can eat it raw. It's wonderful. It does need extra water in the garden, and it needs a lot of shade. A bunch of flowers, have, a, a bunch of our native plants have got both edible flowers and bulbs. You need to cook the bulbs, at least for the Bredier, the Blue Dicks, and the Ethereal Sphere. And you can eat the onion raw. That onion is amazing. So California has got 70 onion species. San Francisco's got two, and our one leaf onion is the one that, that grows most easily. That is an entirely edible plant. The bulb is edible, the seeds are edible, the leaves are edible, and the flowers are edible. The seeds have got a light oniony taste, and the flowers have got a light oniony taste. They're just delicious. So seeds on avocado toast, the onions, the, the flowers, as well as the bulbs added to, um, to scrambled eggs or to a tortilla. They're, they're just delicious. Just keep in mind that every time you eat a bulb, you aren't going to get flowers the next year. So I have been reluctant to eat mine. Um, I tend to just eat the flowers and the seeds. Brodier, Blue Dix, and Ethereal Sphere, all, all wonderful. I love eating those flowers. They taste like crispy lettuce. We have a variety of herbs. Monkey Flower Savory and Coyote Mint are both very, very strong minty flavors. Monkey flower savory prefers shade, and both the leaves and the flowers taste like very, have a very strong minty flavor. You can use them raw, or you can cook them. You can use them for tea. They're delicious. Coyote mint is going to want full sun. Also has very minty flavored leaves. Yerba buena is very interesting. It wants a lot of shade, loves fog, and it tastes like a combination of oregano and a mild mint. So you can use it in uh, you can use it in, in a tea. I eat it raw, um, just crumbled on top of yogurt, on top of stewed uh, squash, Afghani squash. It's delicious, and it definitely prefers quite a bit of shade. California has got eighty nine different sages, and our local sage is the hummingbird sage, Salvia spathica. So you can use the leaves anywhere that you would use a sage leaf in cooking. So in a pasta sauce or a dressing or stuffing. Every one of the different California sages has a different tasting leaf and a different tasting flower. And the hummingbird sage flowers taste like fruit punch. So they are worth growing just for that. They are super fun. So you could add it to a Moroccan carrot salad and that would be delicious. And they grow well in shade. They, they can grow well under a deck. They won't flower if they're in, in full deep dark shade, but even a little bit of sun will get them to, to produce that amazing, delicious flower, and it's a fantastic plant for our hummingbirds. For salad greens, we have a variety of plants. There's miner's lettuce, which is super famous. It is the easiest plant to grow. Get the seeds out of the seed pack and onto any kind of soil. Take them outside where they get some rain. They don't need much rain at all. They grow all the way down to Southern California. So a little bit of, of rain will have them grow. If you decide you want to water them because you've put them in a pot, they will also grow. They're wonderful, they're easy, and they're delicious. They prefer shade, but I've got them growing in full sun as well. Give them a, a couple of years to get started. Treat yourself to a few years, but once to a, a few leaves each year, but give them a couple of years to just sort of spread out and, um, and provide that green ground cover or that green pot for you. And then you can start harvest, harvesting. They're just delicious. Red Maids, also another annual, so it grows well in pots. Fabulous pink flower. Those greens are wonderful in salad. And both of our violets, our native violets here, have got edible leaves. They want a lot of shade. They want some water. And uh, the yellow one and the, the purple violet both have delicious leaves. And I find them easy to grow. They, they like a lot of shade. We have a lot of native fruit. Every fruit in the raspberry family tastes different from every other fruit in the raspberry family. So thimbleberry and salmonberry are both in the raspberry family, 
but their fruits taste different from each other and from anybody else in the raspberry family. They taste different from raspberries and from other blackberries. Thimbleberry is the only raspberry family member I know of that doesn't have any thorns. It's got very soft, soft leaves, it's a kind of plush feeling. So they're wonderful for a children's garden. They will grow. This is another extremely easy plant to grow. I put in one plant and I suddenly had it everywhere. So you have to kind of like it. You would see it at the farmer's market. It's so delicious, except that that red, red berry is only ripe for a day. The day before it's that kind of beige color and the day after it's ripe, it's kind of shriveled. So you want to be out there at the end of June to enjoy your thimbleberries. It can grow in, I've grown it in dry shade, dry shady clay, dry sunny clay, wet, um, shady clay and wet sunny clay. It grows in all of them. It won't actually fruit in shade, in, in extreme shade, but if it gets a little bit of sun, it'll still manage to fruit. Salmonberry is a lot more particular and it does have some pretty impressive thorns. It's got a delicious fruit though and it's got bright hot pink flowers. It wants a lot of water so mine is growing in a seep and hasn't really progressed outside the seep does want a tiny bit of shade uh, of sun to be able to fruit, but it'll flower without any sun at all. Pink flowering currant that Noreen was talking about and that we showed earlier with that fabulous pink flower has got delicious edible fruit. And we've got a couple of different kinds of currants here in San Francisco. Those the fruit is a combination of tart and sweet. So you might want to consider pairing it with something like a roasted parsnip puree. Just that delicious. And it likes a lot of shade. We have more fruit. We have huckleberry. So huckleberry is in the blueberry family. And it tastes as if an East Coast blueberry went on a five hour wine tour in Sonoma and then it came back and you ate it. It's got that deep, complex, whiny flavor. I just think it's more delicious than any blueberry I've ever tasted. It supports a lot of, of caterpillars on its leaves. It's got shiny evergreen leaves. It's sort of slow growing to start. Uh, mine is 12 years old and finally got to about four feet. There is a cultivar called Blue Madonna that I got from Pete Villeneuve at East Bay Wild. $25 for a one gallon. I don't know what he's charging for it now, but worth every penny. It just flowers a lot more heavily and fruits a lot more heavily. I've got that and I've got the, the regular species and it's consistently the, the cultivar has produced more flowers, more fruit. And this way there are huckleberries both for me and for the birds. Coast bars, gar, barberries, another interestingly important habitat plant. It doesn't support as many caterpillars as the currants or the huckleberry or the strawberry that we're about to get to, but it does bloom from December to February. So it's really important for as an early blooming flower for bees and for hummingbirds. It's got a very bright yellow flower. So very easy to see, very showy, shiny evergreen leaves, and a wonderful hedge, so oh, fantastic, um, fantastic ecosystem plant. It does come in a nice flat version if you decide you would rather have it as a ground cover. We've got a couple of different kinds of strawberries. We've got the woodland strawberry and the beach strawberry. The beach strawberry will only grow on sandy soil. And according to Jake Sig, the woodland strawberry will grow on both clay and sandy soil. And I've got that, uh, I've got the woodland growing in my clay garden. The clay can, the woodland can take a lot more shade than the beach strawberry. They both produce edible strawberry flavored fruit. Um, unlike the blueberry family where there is some difference in flavor and the raspberry family where there's an enormous difference in flavor from plant to plant. I find that the woodland strawberry and the beach strawberry both just taste like supermarket strawberries. Of course, the supermarket strawberry could taste a lot like our beach strawberry because it's got beach strawberry genetics in it. They, they, they're a wonderful ground cover. They are evergreen. Um, they do 
they just do really well. They're not a dense ground cover, so I've got it mixed with the Yerba Buena, which is another great ground cover, and with some um, miner's lettuce, which is only a ground cover during the winter, but still those three together seem to work really well as ground covers. And we have fruit trees, in case you hadn't, didn't have enough fruit. We have the holly leaf cherry tree, which I have heard can take some shade. It loves wind and fog. It is the, the big plant in the coastal dune scrub community. So if you've got a windy, foggy garden with or without some shade, that holly leaf cherry, cherry tree is going to love it. And that is edible, delicious fruit, according to Grace Sang, who is on uh, who's on today. So thank you for that information, Grace. We also have the Osa berry tree, which also likes sandy soil with delicious edible fruit, and the blue elderberry tree, which is very, very easy to grow. It will get shrubby, but it's just, it's just great. Delicious edible fruit. The leaves are wonderful at supporting insects. So you get a, it, together between the insects and the fruit, it's a great bird attractant plant. So these are all wonderful, delicious, edible fruit trees for the garden. And we've got a couple of nut trees. We've got the California hazelnut. You're going to need two of those to get nuts, but it's a gorgeous form. It's got that fantastic vase form that just doesn't need a lot of pruning. Wonderful for insects. The, the leaves do get chewed on, and if you've got two of them and you got the two from different sources, then you'll get nuts. The California bay laurel is delicious, and it is unfortunately a sudden oak uh, death vector. So you might consider visiting some of our already existing California bay laurel trees. The leaves have got more of a fruity flavor than the European bay laurel that is used as a, um, used as a spice in our, um, in, in various sauces. The nuts are amazing. So this is in the avocado family. So if you imagine an avocado, you would actually take off the, the thin skin around it, take those nuts, usually the avocado pit, pit that you would discard. The pit is what you're going to keep on the California bay laurel tree. Let them sit out for about six weeks so that they can outgas because they're very oily and then roast them at a very, very high temperature. And they taste like a combination of chocolate and hazelnut and coffee, and they are delicious. So we have a large, full-grown, publicly accessible bay laurel tree here in Russian Hill. It is managed by the Russian Hill neighbors. It is on the western side of McCondry Lane at Jones. So the famous part of McCondry Lane is the east part. This is the west part, so it's across the street from the famous McCondry Lane. It is being managed by the Russian Hill neighbors. They do have a, a lot of ivy there. Feel free to step on the ivy, but do be careful. Uh, they are, we are installing a lot of little tiny new native plants, and we'd rather not have the native plants uh, trampled on. And because this is openly accessible to the public, it is a San Francisco Department of Public Works space. Just please, please be respectful of the fact that a lot of people may want to go to that tree to taste the leaves and the nuts and just take a couple as if it were Halloween candy. So you guys down in Santa Clara Valley chapter have got the magnificent bay laurel tree in a Palo Alto open space. And I have not seen that tree personally. I have seen pictures of it and it is listed as one of the enormous trees in, in California, so definitely worth going to see. So many of you may know this, but we're just going to do a little bit of review about how to best garden with native plants, when to plant, which is during the rainy season, and knowing your soil type when you're selecting plants. Our rainy season is going to start soon, I hope. It's November through February. That is the best time to go get a plant and install a plant, especially if you're new to planting native plants. Please, please, please plant during the rainy season. You will have your most success then. Rainy season is when native plants are growing their roots 
and the summer dry season is when a lot of things go dormant and just hope to survive to the next rainy season. So plant during the rain. And know your soil. You don't necessarily need to have a geologist out there. Just go use something pokey and go poke into your soil and see if you've got rocky soil or sandy soil or clay soil. There's actually a little part of, of San Francisco that has naturally loamy soil near McLaren Park, so lucky you. But all of us have got plants that evolved here that our insects are waiting for and our birds are looking forward to. So go figure out what your, what your soil type is and then choose your plants accordingly. I keep trying to grow lupines that only want to grow on sandy soil. I keep trying to grow them in clay and they keep dying. So keep in mind that if you are going to experiment with a plant that doesn't expect your soil type, that might not always go well. So let's look for our edible garden resources. We're going to learn about ethnobotany, access to our plant lists, uh, Cowscape Native Plant Selection Tool, Native Plant Sources, and iNaturalist. This is the search term. Ethnobotany is the search term. Ethnobiology is another search term, but ethnobotany is really the search term to find out what plants are used by food, by indigenous peoples, uh, as well as medicines and tools. I happen to like the Daniel Mormon Native American Ethnobotany book. It is a compilation of the published ethnobotany, ethnobotanical resources at the time. And he's got a website that lets you search for the specific plants. Keep in mind that for the ethnobotany book, you get it, uh, information is by plant and by tribe and by use. Whereas the website, it's, it's just by plant, but still very, very useful to know what's edible. So if you've got a question about something that's edible, that is the, this is the search term to use. That's the book and the website to use. So San Francisco, Native Plant, uh, California Native Plant Society, the Yerba Buena chapter, we have got edible plant um, handouts, flyers on our biodiversity section of our, of our website, as well as hummingbird plants, bee plants, and butterfly plants. Calscape, which is the California Native Plant Society tool, is the best place to find out how big that plant's going to get, what kind of soil does it, does, does it expect, how much water does it need, and what's its general range. Keep in mind that the Calscape radius is 10 miles, and San Francisco is 7 miles by 7 miles, so it is going to recommend a bunch of plants to you that are wrong for your soil. So know what your soil type is, and when it it goes ahead and recommends a lupine even if you're on clay, just keep in mind you shouldn't plant that and expect it to live. Calscape also has a tab that will show you where all of our nurseries are. The nursery is not only for our perennials, but also for annuals and bulbs. Pete's East Bay Wilds is on there, and frankly, Pete is my go-to nursery guy whenever I've got a question about edible plants and just exactly which current should I be planting. He's the man I go to. Um, Pete's eaten a lot of these plants and can talk me through what they taste like. So I really appreciate that. Larner Seeds is a wonderful place to go to find out more information about edible seeds. You can go to the ethnobotany site. Pete can talk to you too, but Larner specifically, um, Judith Larner Lowry has got wonderful information about which seeds are edible and she carries them and that information is on her website. Can't recommend that strongly enough. If you are planting in window boxes or in pots or any kind of container, annuals are really easy to grow, as are bulbs. And she has got the great site for you to, to be successful in container gardening. Annuals and bulbs, of course, also grow in the ground. But if what you've got is a north-facing pot, uh, is, is a north-facing balcony and pots on that, Judith Larner Lowry, that's your site. Hi, Naturalist. You're hearing about this again and again. This is a free citizen science application written and supported by the California Academy of Science. And it lets you search for plants and wildlife and see what those interactions are. If what you want to do is go take a look and see, okay, that, that whole red flowering current sounds really pretty. 
where does that grow? I want to see that in person. I want to see it big before I commit myself to a plant. This is the tool to use. It's been very useful for me. So I want to thank everyone who did all the professional photography for the bees and the flowers and the hummingbirds. This has been California Native Plant Society. We have free lectures, free hikes when it's not COVID, and free resources on our website. So let's go take some, some questions. Lots of things in Q&A. Oh, Carrie, you've got a golden currant. You planted it three years ago, still no fruit. I got to tell you, I tried to grow golden currant in clay. I don't know what your sand, uh, what your soil situation is, but I tried to grow it in clay and it, it, it's riparian. It wants a lot more water than you might think. And uh, that could be one of the reasons it's, it doesn't have fruit. And let's see, what else do we have? Yeah, talk to, talk to Pete about growing things in, in containers. Oh, Grace, thank you so much. Another local San Francisco native cherry is, um, is the choke cherry. That's the Prunus virginianus, I think. And Grace, oh, wild strawberries, you're loving the flavor. Wonderful. Oh, thank you, Gabriella. You're talking about the, the land trust. Um, this may not have gone out to attendees. Gabriella, if you wouldn't mind uh, copying that and pasting that back in for both panelists and attendees to get the uh, Sogorea Te Land Trust information. Um, thank you so much for including that. And. Uh, Oh no, Mary, you're paying attention to where your, your dog is peeing and your hummingbird sage. Generally, the, those issues are down closer to the ground and the hummingbird sage can be a little bit taller than that. Oh, let's see. Um, no, no, Aunt Carrie, not all of the poppy is edible, only, only the seeds. Only the seeds are edible on the poppy. There's a lot of other plants that are entirely edible. The salvia, um, the, the chia sage is the one that is entirely edible. Okay. Oh, thank you, Gabriella, for, for pasting that back in. I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions about the edible? Edible plants. Okay. Not managing to open the chat. And I just saw we had a question about mushrooms. Um, so there have been, there's the San Francisco Mycological Society. All of these ecosystem groups inter, sort of interchange information. There's the California Native Plant Society, there's Golden Gate Audubon, and there's the San Francisco Mycological Society. They have given a talk to California Native Plant Society. It was, uh, we had sort of an overwhelming response there's a wonderful set of books on identifying California mushrooms. My recommendation is do not just get a book. Go, go join the Mycological Society and go on some of their hikes. They're, you don't want to end up mistaking your mushrooms. Yeah, Calscape, it doesn't matter what, what address you type in, it's still a 10-mile radius, so just be really careful. Um, Linda, uh, I mentioned the fruit trees. So original species and cultivars. Linda, you're absolutely right. Doug Tallamy talks about staying, uh, staying to original species to maximize habitat. 
this particular cultivar is just one that has additional flowers and fruit. So it's safe to use. Uh, Doug Tallamy's latest book, Nature's Best Hope. Doug talks about what makes cultivars good and bad. If they had different colored leaves or if the flowers are double or a different shape, that's what can make a cultivar bad. This particular cultivar, I would not recommend if, uh, if it were bad for, for my environment. Um, I have seen the leaves get chewed on and that is the highest compliment that you can get from your ecosystem. So it's the huckleberry shrub that turns into eventually a hedge. That's the only cultivar that, that I'm recommending in, and it, it is definitely safe and okay to use in the ecosystem. What else do we have? Gabriella. Um, so Gabriella, you're looking to find out what's growing in your, in your yard. I use iNaturalist for that. iNaturalist has helped me identify, be a, a better identifier for plants as well as a identify, better identifier for insects and for birds. So I would recommend using iNaturalist, taking a, a photo, uploading that, and having um, iNaturalist that has got a, both a community doing live identifications and an artificial intelligence that's being trained by the community to identify plants. So definitely double check what iNaturalist recommends, but that's what I'm currently using for, for plant identification. Um, let's see, any other questions? A couple more in Q&A. Okay. Am I missing those? Oh, the huckleberry cultivar. I, it's the Blue Madonna, and I got it from Pete at East Bay Wilds, although a lot of people may have it. Oh, Amy's got questions about watering through the first year and when we have triple-digit smoke days for the weeks. So um, I, I plant during the rainy season. I water every day until we start getting rain. Then I water every three days until we start getting regular rain. And then I make sure that there is water once a week, even for Ceanothus, through the first and second summers. So that's the irrigation or the, the watering. Some plants need something very specific. Mike Belcher was talking about how the Dutchman's pipeline wants that very deep watering. Uh, I did not deeply water my pipelines, which could be one of the reasons that it took them so long to grow, but they, they have done okay. For the smoke days, the issue is um, not just the heat, although that's an issue too. In fact, any day where it's over about 95, I, I like to make sure that I give them some additional water just because it is San Francisco and we're not expecting it to be quite so warm here. One of the problems is the ash depositing on leaves. If your hose has got a mister on it, go use that to mist off the ash from the leaves at least once a week during our fire season. And someone has a question about which of the current is very puckery. So the, each of the currants tastes different. I would go to, to your favorite nursery and chat with them about which one tastes like what. Uh, Pete Villeneuve at East Bay Wilds can absolutely talk to each one of the flavors on those currants. I, my golden currant never did bloom, and I, uh, I don't know how to say this, I haven't grown a pink flowering currant, I've only eaten them out of public landscapes, <laughs> so I don't find them particularly puckery, but I would, I would talk with Pete about that, he's fantastic about um, talking me through what tastes like what. What other questions do we have about food? Anything else? Okay. Any last questions? Go Looks ahead. like that's it. Susan, thank you so much for keeping everything on track and on schedule. We moved this along pretty fast. There were some technical difficulties, but I think we got through those okay. And um, you're an amazing hostess. 
And uh, thanks for the great education on edibles. I can't wait to uh, plant some more this fall. Yeah, and thank you all for, for participating in the community and sharing all of your knowledge with us. I, I appreciate everyone who, who not only presented, but all of the people who were giving us good information on, um, in, the, in the chat and the Q&A. Ooh, Google Lens, wonderful. That's good to know that Google is finally doing a better job on plants. All right, good luck everybody in, in planting season. And thank you all for, for showing up.